Hi, good evening and welcome. I'm on amphetamines and they're absolutely fantastic. Bang! I am the Divine David, not the Beast of Jersey. And I want you to have a feeding frenzy. I am the Divine David. Oh, yes. I speak for humanity. I don't think that I'll ever come back to Earth. This really is my last time here. It's been a trip. But I know there's somewhere else to go. Would you like to come with me? I think it'll be fun, don't you? Can I just give you a word of advice? Can I just give you a word of advice? There's more to life than buttering bits of bread. Oh, yes, there's life on Earth. But then there must be life elsewhere. Somewhere else in the galaxy, the universe, call it what you will. Shall we go and explore it together and find out? The next time you're in a supermarket, walk past the cashier, walk past the till, and they'll say, what are you doing stealing those goods? And you could say, bang! On tonight's show, we've got Gilles. Oint this. And we've got this. And later on, I'll be revealing the true sordid world of the shop assistant. Hello and welcome to this week's masterclass. I'll be dealing with the world of fashion. When you're wearing something plain, it really is quite important that you cheer it up with something. I'm referring to applique. It used to be fashionable in the 80s. I'm trying to bring it back. You can use anything that you may have at home. Something like a, a plaster, for example. Watch what I do with this. A diagonal. Isn't that beautiful? Should I make a cross, do you think? I will. Isn't that beautiful? I've cheated a little bit. Here's some earrings I made earlier on. Can you see what they're made out of? Just a little bit of tin foil. I've been wrapping some sandwiches for the children earlier on. One goes over like that. Beautiful. If you were to go to a banqueting suite or a Masonic lodge and walk in looking like this, you really would be a head turner. <coughs> and with the applique work, you're really in the realm of high fashion. Gold safety pen. Make yourself a brooch. Do you remember the back of the plaster that we used earlier on? But what I'm going to do. Beautiful. We are all are very prone to pollution. So what I recommend is a mask, very important. I look a little bit like Michael Jackson, don't I? We have a common a garden tea towel, that there is a beautiful design. And let's go for a slightly bohemian look. Can you see that there's a Dutch influence there? One is often walking along the street and somebody will come up to you wearing a sweatshirt or maybe even a t-shirt. Declaring the brand name. Now, I do think that clothes should say something about you. And this says something about me. Can you see what I've done? That's lovely. I'm going to make a waistcoat out of newspaper. Just make a hole. Now, really enjoy this, and it's a real hands-on operation. And the satisfaction that you get when you walk down the street knowing that you have transformed yourself, you've inspired others to do something similar, is quite ego gratification-wise very good. A waistcoat. Isn't that beautiful? Now, none of us want to look like morons, do we, in the high street? And it really is, and I can't emphasize this enough, it really is very important that you inject a little bit of you into your costume. Let yourself loose, free yourself, express yourself. It really is quite rewarding. I think that really brings this masterclass to a close. Thank you very much. This is television, not a steak and kidney pie. Hello. Yes, it's time for post bag. I've been absolutely inundated with mail this week. We've been turning away your letters and packages. 
It's lovely to hear from you. But at the same time, some of your stories, they are rather banal. <sighs> Only joking. Let's have a look what they are. Huh. It feels kind of shiny. <laughs> Scars. Cheered that one up. Isn't that a lovely idea? The idea of one's skin telling a story. Thank you, whoever sent me those. They're beautiful. Good Lord. It's another video. It's all gone horribly, Channel 4. Welcome, everybody, to this beautiful tour of London, uh, given by the Divine David. I'd like to share with you some of my impressions of this wonderful city. I have to say that there are no toilet facilities on this London Pride tour. Um, so please feel free to go where you sat. Okay. We're hurtling along now at 90 miles an hour. If we were to crash, you'd go hurtling out of your seat and probably have really bad head injuries. We're just about to cross the Thames Canal it's not a river, it's a canal, it's man-made, very much a working canal, bringing all sorts of plastic and leather goods down from Kew Gardens. London is really semi-rural, focused on the trees, absolutely infested with the grey squirrel, which has depleted the native red squirrel to quite a worrying extent. Oh dear, we seem to have just run over somebody. Doesn't matter. St. Paul's Cathedral, the divorce of the Prince and Princess of Wales, was held here at St. Paul's Cathedral. It looks like stone, but it is actually made out of polystyrene. Built in 1914, just as a start to celebrate the beginning of the First World War. Isn't it lovely? Now, this tree is very famous. Um, it's rumoured that Princess Margaret... Yes, Princess Margaret. You know Princess Margaret. Um, she used to live in that tree. Yes. It was just after she had finished her relationship with Group Captain Townsend, and she used to live in a hammock in that tree for a number of years. If any of you feel sick, will you please do it over the side of the bus? Um, as I don't want to be cleaning up sick when you've left. OK. It's 
could we drive on now, please? That's lovely. Thank you. Here, on my right, um, is being made a huge open grave. As to who goes into the open grave, we're not too sure at the moment. But it could be people who perhaps don't have a lot of money. Not many people know how the Great Fire of London started. It started here, and it was due to somebody lighting joss sticks, which burned right down, and before we knew where we were, the whole of London was engulfed in flame. It happened here. Yeah. The Great Fire of London. I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't want you to think that I'm a historical revisionist. Oh, no. The orange boat that we see there is taking human excrement from the Savoy Hotel to dump just on the other side of that beautiful Vauxhall Bridge that we see there. You've just seen a heron fly over. That's Lambeth Palace, home to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Sometimes you can see him at the top um, being persuaded to come down. He has really bad alcohol problems. We seem to be in a famous London traffic jam at the moment. Let's hope it doesn't rain. On my left, left, on my left, the Thames merges in with the Ganges. You can probably see people um, washing saffron-coloured robes just on the other side of that pier. That beautiful. London, quite a big city, has a population of 17,000 in the London metropolitan region. Some famous Cockneys who have lived around here, Jules Verne, Jane Austen, and Jesse Matthews. We're just on the outer skirts of London's West End, home to many of the most beautiful British productions, including The Pajama Game, There's a Girl in My Soup, and some such farces. Great, the huge column that we see behind me uh, is in celebration of the work of Lady Norman Foster. The building just beyond the celebratory column to Lady Norman Foster is, of course, Battersea Power Station. Behind me, I think, the Duke of Edinburgh. Hello. <clears throat> We're just passing the London home of Shirley Bassey. I'd just like to conclude the tour today and say thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and of edification. And I hope that the next time you have a dinner party, perhaps you'll be having a pasta dish in Italy, you can tell people what you've learned on the tour today. Thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Here's one for the over 60s. For the over 60s.
That really disturbed me. Shop assistants. Let me tell you about shop assistants. For I have example of being one. I know what it's all about. I know what is expected of a shop assistant. Walk into a shop, and there the shop assistants are. Getting by on between five and six pounds a week. From which they have to pay for their own lunches, transport, their own clothes, and also fresh straw for their mangers. Say you're working in a clothes shop. If a garment is damaged, then the shop assistant has to pay for the repair out of their five or six pounds a week. Many shop assistants only have one shoe, and many of them can't afford undergarments, for example. Shop assistants can't afford shampoo, and very often have an infestation of lice or mange or small termite-type creatures which linger in their hair, should they have any. Because, oh yes, shop assistants are so poor that they suffer from malnutrition. And many of them have very, very, very bad cases of alopecia, minge, ear canker, and also their hooves sometimes have little stones in, and the shopkeepers won't remove them. They are the representatives of the business, the shop, when we walk in. And yet some of them live lives far worse than any donkey. Increasingly, shop assistants are turning to prostitution. Oh, yes. Don't be surprised if the next time you're in the fishing room, the shop assistant sidles up next to you. Be it a 16-year-old trainee or a more elderly, portly lady in one of the so-called posher shops. It's their only option. Please, give generously. 50 pence can make a big difference to a shop assistant. Please help the shop assistants. They can't help themselves. Why do people always have to take the clothes off? Hmm? Hello. I've just been reading a story, which I believe will interest you. It concerns three goats. Somewhere in Berkshire. 
uh, of varying sizes, a small, a medium, and a large. Now, what the goats are attempting to do is to cross a river utilizing a wooden bridge. Now, underneath the bridge, it's reported here, lives a big, fat, ugly troll. <laughs> and what's been happening is that a series of events has been unfolding, namely, one, the smallest billy goat gruff um, attempted to cross the bridge. The troll remonstrated with him and said, under no circumstances can I grant you permission. And the little goat said, don't eat me, eat my brother. He's a little bit bigger than me, and I think you'll find him more rewarding in the, f the, flesh, in the flesh department. So the medium-sized billy goat gruff attempts to cross the bridge. And again, this big, fat, ugly troll says, no, 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 you can't, no, you can't cross the bridge. But the medium-sized goat then says to the troll, don't, don't, don't eat, me eat me, because my elder brother, he's got more flesh on him than even me. The third billy goat gruff is a really big, well, a big fucker, really. And the old troll, really hungry, <laughs> wanting it, really desperate for all that goat flesh, goat flesh, allows him to cross, which is rather nice, isn't it? But this story has a bit of a twist, because the big billy goat then butts this ugly old troll using his horns and the troll goes up into the air and then goes down 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 into the swirling water and it won't come as any surprise he did actually drown he drowned he died and that meant that the three billy goats could live happily ever after and everything was nice and everything and i think it's a story that we can all draw quite a lot of strength from the moral of this particular story would seem to say that if you've got a good butt, you can get anywhere. Lovely. Bye!